Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Cécile Tremblay and myself as the clinical track co-chairs, I'd like to welcome you all this morning for the clinical sciences track plenary. Um, bonjour à tous et bienvenue à la plénière de la piste des sciences cliniques. C'est avec grand plaisir que je vous présente notre conférencière plénière ce matin, la Dr. Deborah Persaud. Dr. Persaud est professeuse de pédiatrie à l'école de médecine de l'Université Johns Hopkins au département des maladies infectieuses. Au cours des 15 dernières années, ses recherches ont porté sur la latence du VIH et les obstacles à la guérison des, des infections périnatales par le VIH. En 2013, elle se retrouva sur les projecteurs internationaux suite au rapport de son groupe de, au sujet de ce qui a finalement été qualifié de rémission virale à long terme du VIH chez un enfant, le cas maintenant bien connu du bébé du Mississippi. Dr. Persaud occupe la chaire scientifique du Comité pour la guérison du VIH du réseau IMPACT. Elle est considérée comme l'experte mondiale hein, concernant les réservoirs du VIH et de la recherche de la guérison chez les enfants. Nous sommes très heureux et chanceux de l'avoir avec nous pour cette présentation plénière. It's my great pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker this morning, Dr. Deborah Prasad. Dr. Prasad is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Disease at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and her research focus over the past 15 years has been in the field of HIV latency and barriers to cure in perinatal HIV infection. In 2013, she rose to international attention with her group's report of what was eventually deemed to be a case of long-term HIV viral remission in a child, the now well-known case of the Mississippi baby. Dr. Prasad is the scientific chair for the HIV Cure Committee for the IMPACT Network and is considered the world expert on HIV reservoirs and cure research in children. We're very fortunate and excited to have her uh, and to hear her plenary talk this morning entitled HIV Latency and Perinatal Infection, Opportunities and Challenges Towards Remission and Cure. Dr. Prasad. Good morning and thank the organizers for really giving me the opportunity to be here at the 24th Annual CAR and to present our work on uh, an overview really of HIV cure research, where we are, where we're going, and the opportunities and um, challenges that we face as we embark on this new uh, treatment, but an important treatment paradigm for HIV infected persons around the world. And that is the overall goal of this uh, new and emerging research agenda is to change uh, a lifelong course of antiretroviral treatment to a time limited uh, treatment of art. So sort of analogous to um, HIV cancer therapeutic models where patients are placed in remission and followed to establish whether they've been cured or not. And so I have uh, no financial uh, disclosures uh, for the past uh, two years to declare today. And, and the three learning objectives, and it's the way I've uh, split up the talk, is really to understand uh, HIV reservoirs as barriers to cure, gain knowledge on biomarkers of HIV persistence and their relevance to HIV cure research, and, and also in the management of HIV-infected patients who may test negative with our standard uh, clinical assays while on antiretroviral treatment, and to acquire new information on current approaches to disrupt HIV latency, and reservoir formation towards HIV remission and cure. And so I thought what I'd do is start with some key concepts and definitions that are being used in the field. And these concepts and definitions are really important for providing the framework to establish how do we assess these new interventions as to whether they're having an effect on what we're trying to target. And that is the, the overall goal of these new therapeutic strategies are to target viral reservoirs, to disrupt HIV latency, to sufficiently clear these uh, infected cells from persons that are not cleared with our standard antiretroviral treatment to hopefully reduce their quantity sufficiently to allow a person to go off antiretroviral drugs, most likely in the context of combined immunotherapeutic approaches such as broadly neutralizing antibodies and T-cell-based vaccines 
vaccines, as you heard discussed uh, this morning. And so the first two concepts that we should uh, just start out with is definitions of a reservoir and definition of latency. And what a reservoir now, and this actually becomes really important, is that a reservoir is really a population of cells that allows HIV to persist in a replication competent form despite years of continuous effective suppression of virus replication on antiretroviral treatment. And latency is a subset of a reservoir, but it is the predominant reservoir that exists in patients on long-term heart. And this is a non-productive state of infection. So in other, in, in other words, as you heard from Dr. Palmer this morning, HIV is a retrovirus. It integrates into your host genome, and it can remain in a quiescent state. But that um, integrated genome has the capacity to reverse itself, to become productive of virus infection productive of virus infection at any time point. And it, it's this capacity to reverse latency and cause that infected cell to produce virus that will allow us to target these cells with immune-based uh, therapies and neurotreatment strategies. And then the three concepts that I, I will start with in terms of definitions is the end game here is to really uh, end up with patients who may fall into three categories, sterilizing cure, functional cure, and viral remission. Now the term remission was really brought into the field, I think, because of the Mississippi case because it was really not clear to what extent that child had actually been cured of HIV and highlights the real importance of following patients long term, not providing false hope of a cure, and to really be able to come up with concepts to, to manage this uh, new field. So sterilizing cure, and today we've only had one uh, known case of, of sterilizing cure, and that's the case of the Berlin patient, which I'll discuss uh, briefly later in the talk. Sterilizing cure is a state in which an HIV-infected person, so a person who had established infection, chronically infected uh, cells, in which an intervention led to actually complete eradication of HIV-infected cells that are capable of um, rekindling uh, viremia, so harboring replication component uh, viral genomes. Functional cure, that HIV-infected person can still maintain detectable uh, reservoirs, meaning having reservoirs that can produce replication competent virus, but somehow there are immune mechanisms uh, that are able to maintain that uh, virus population in check to permit the person to go off antiretroviral treatment, maintain undetectable clinical viral loads at levels that are not capable of being transmitted to other infected individuals and, and promoting disease progression. And then the third is uh, viral remission, which I think that the Mississippi case best exemplifies. And this is viral suppression of antiretroviral drugs for some defined period of time, but will eventually uh, lead to a viremic relapse of an unknown uh, duration. Um, but nevertheless, you've been able to accomplish a person to move off of antiretroviral uh, treatment for some period of time. Now, what that optimal time should be, we don't really know. Should it be six months, 12 months, two years? or more, it's still unclear, and this is a moving target. But the, the bottom line framework for HIV cure research is to extend the time where a patient can go off antiretroviral treatment. Now, the major challenge for the field of HIV cure research now is the only way we, the only way we have now to really identify what our treatment strategy or intervention will lead, has actually had an effect to lead to cure, functional cure remission or sterilizing cure, is to withdraw antiretroviral drugs. And this has really become an ethical uh, challenge for the field in terms of enrolling patients into clinical trials where we currently have no biomarkers that are predictive of uh, virus cure. Um, in these patients. And so as, as we go through this talk, I, as I discuss biomarkers, I want to keep uh, you to keep this in mind that we really don't quite yet know what that biomarker should be to deem a person while they're on treatment that have been cured of HIV infection. And so this is what we have in terms of our framework for HIV cure research. And these data were actually published in 1999, very shortly after it became apparent that uh, standard combination antiretroviral drugs that uh, completely inhibit virus replication to the point that plasma viral loads reach undetectable levels. That you, after two years of antiretroviral treatment, patients stopping antiretroviral drugs, unanimously most patients have rapid reestablishment of uremia. And what you see on this curve is this typical upslope of within uh, two to three weeks of discontinuing therapy, there is rapid uh, reestablishment of uremia. Often it is to let the pretreatment levels, and so the antiretroviral treatment and duration of treatment didn't affect 
um, the, the time to viremic rebound. And so it's this time frame of two to three weeks of viremic rebound that's provide the framework and guide for what should we expect from a treatment strategy to say this has had an effect? And so what we hope to be able to do, and you'll see uh, through the course of this talk, that there are cluster of cases that are representative of all three components that I've described, sterilizing cure, functional cure, and remission, um, in terms of time to virologic rebound, that it's a aiding the field in, in developing these uh, targets uh, for treatment. Now, more recently, and this is a pretty incredible study done, done by Tim Shacker's group in which they actually uh, compared uh, the, a cross-body compartment circulating uh, blood cells in tissue compartments in the gut and lymph nodes looking for the biomarker profile that would help predict which patients uh, would actually experience delayed avaremic rebound on standard art. And what you see on this slide is just like the last slide I showed you. In 1999, where the time to viremic rebound was somewhere between two to three weeks. In this cohort of patients, you'll see, and these patients were sampled every uh, three times a week uh, once off antiretroviral treatment. And what you can see in generally the time slope hasn't really, or the time frame hasn't really changed with respect to time to viremic uh, rebound. Most patients rebounded within two to three weeks of stopping antiretroviral treatment. And what's important about this slide is actually this is the first study to look at a median time of suppression of 10 years. So even after patients have been suppressed for up to 10 years of continuous antiretroviral treatment with standard antiretroviral combination therapies, we've not changed the time to viremic rebound. So what I hope to, that I've um, convinced you today is we do have a metric for assessing uh, or cure research strategies in proof of concept uh, studies, and that is time to viremic rebound. So extending that time frame beyond uh, two to three weeks or two to four weeks. Now, why is there um, such rapid rebound, such a predictable pattern of rebound? And these, uh, this pattern of rebound of two to four weeks has also been seen in, in pediatric HIV infection, where patients have undergone uh, structure treatment interruption to assess its effects on, on boosting uh, cell-mediated immunity to adulterous virus, such as in the P1015, uh, impact P1015 clinical trial. Also in the PENTA trial of children uh, interrupting treatment, this same part with, with, with different subtypes of HIV, the same pattern of two to four weeks of viremic rebound. So what's the, the best explanation to date for this uh, unanimous or uniform pattern of viremic rebound of two to three weeks is best explained by the persistence of HIV in the reservoir for HIV in resting memory CD4 T cells, which you see on this slide highlighted in white, the orange representing a quiescent integrated uh, proviral genome, but has replication uh, components through its reversal mechanisms from immune activation. So what we know now from over 15 years of study in this field, and these are seminal studies done by the list of authors you see on, on the bottom of the slide that, that became, uh, that were reported shortly after um, combination antiretroviral treatment became standard of care, is that this reservoir is established very early in infection, and it, uh, it does not contribute to a large degree to HIV viremia in patients who are untreated because the dominant source of HIV virions in plasma in untreated patients are cells, um, activated CD4 T cells that turn over on a daily basis. But these cells become a dominant source of low-level virus production in patients on combination therapy for decades. And so they become the major source of rebound viremia when patients stop treatment. Several uh, studies, and we've done these studies in children, showing the genetic uh, relatedness between low-level residual plasma virus, meaning below 50 copies. Um, studies by um, Frank Maldarelli's group show that, on average, uh, HIV-infected patients on therapy have about three copies of RNA per mil of plasma at any given time point on the effective therapies. And one major source is this reservoir and resting memory CD4 T cells. And so with recent mathematical models by Bob Salcano's group has suggested that the reason for this rapid rebound of two to four weeks is that the 
it's really a quantitative difference. And so having on average one infected cell per million resting CD4 T cells gives a sufficient target for immune activation events to occur and cause continue, reversal of latency and continuous virus production from this source which um, combination antiretroviral therapy is effective in suppressing new rounds of uh, replication once virus is elicited from these cells. So how is this reservoir is established? And it's really important to think about this. So this is the model that was put forward by Bob Silcon in 1997. I think it, it holds up to date. And the Mississippi case is the best example to suggest that HIV latency can um, persist for quite a while in the absence of antiretroviral uh, therapy without resurfacing. And so the basic model here, and this is actually really important for perinatal infection and very early therapy to achieve reservoir reduction and remission and cure. And that is, is that this reservoir is formed in the context of immunologic memory um, formation. So when a naive T cell encounters its cognitive antigen, the cell be, uh, differentiates and proliferates into an activated CD4 T cells. That's, the, that's really the prime target for HIV replication. And so as with any anagenic encounter and naive T cell uh, stimulation, these cells are designed for a subpopulation of them to revert to a resting uh, state with to provide immunologic memory for life. And so it's this persistence of um, in, infection of HIV in an activated cell reversion to a quiescent state that allows um, HIV to persist in, in this quiescent form in resting memory CD4 T cells that with immune activation um, in an immune activation environment or re-encounter with that antigen, these cells become continued sources for virus production. Now, we've learned recently from uh, seminal studies by Nicholas Schoemann is that arresting memory CD4 T cell is actually not uh, a uniform population of cells. It's actually made up of very different uh, T cell memory phenotypes that have different lifespans and different capacity to carry HIV genomes and different ways of maintaining themselves. So the most important uh, reservoir that has been shown in HIV-infected adults, and this has not been done systematically in pediatric populations, currently because of the large blood volumes that's required to do this, but is in central memory CD4 positive T cells. And the, the, the unique feature of these central memory T cells is they undergo self-renewal and homeostatic proliferation. And in, in that process, they likely do not express any viral proteins and therefore cannot be targeted by immune surveillance mechanisms. So this provides a central uh, basis for uh, reservoir persistence in memory T cells. And I'm focusing on the CD4 positive T cell population, but clearly there are studies that need to be done to characterize other reservoirs, such as in tissue-based uh, macrophages. And so how do we detect, and so this goes to our biomarker profiling, how do we detect and characterize and quantify these cells over time in HIV-infected persons? And the first studies that were done in developing these assays um, required large blood volumes to, to do so, so starting with 180 mLs of blood. Now with patients on effective antiretroviral treatment, I think leukopax or 250 to 500 mLs of bloods are required to, to really test and, and detect these cells and quantify them carefully over time. And so the, the basic method, and it's uh, referred to as QVO, or quantitative viral outgrowth assay, to detect persistence of replication competent virus in persons on effective antiretroviral treatment is shown here on this slide. And essentially what is done is peripheral blood is taken and the peripheral blood mononuclear cells separated and resting CD4 cells purified uh, from, from the cell fraction. And these cells are then placed in an in vitro system to maximally stimulate them to reverse HIV latency and force those cells to the, the force expression of the viral genomes to produce uh, HIV virions in the culture supernatant that can be detect detected after 14 days of co-culture using HIV um, CD4 cells from uninfected infected uh, persons. This is labor intensive, it takes about two weeks, uh, costs about $1,000, up to $3,000 per assay depending on how many cells um, you're assaying. But it provides important information, it gives information on the replication competence uh, and the quantity of replication competent virions still present in that person. And it also allows you to do genetic characterization of full length HIV uh, genomes, uh, replication competent induced um, genomes and those that are non-induced. And, and over the past uh, 15 years, we've optimized these methods to study the reservoir in pediatric populations where obviously taking 180 mLs of blood is simply not 
not feasible, but because of the larger CD4 T cell numbers in children, we've been able to do this on as low as uh, three mLs of blood. Now, here's the, the uh, signature slide from Bob Solcano's group showing that despite up to seven to eight years of continuous antiretroviral treatment, the concentration of these cells circulating in the peripheral blood remains about the same, and it's about one per million um, infected, uh, one infected cell per million resting CD4 uh, T cells with, with uh, half-lives of about 44 months. Um, similar studies uh, recently done by Dave Margolis' group showed that even up to 10 to 15 years, this uh, half-life does not appear to change in HIV-infected adults. And it's with these uh, studies that the general conclusion was that antiviral treatment needs to be lifelong for HIV-infected individuals. Now, the other biomarker that's used to measure HIV persistence over time and look at the effects on, on antiviral treatment on decay of infected cells is proviral DNA measurements. So these are HIV DNA measurements, copies per million peripheral blood mononuclear cells or CD4 positive T cells. And this is a good, simple biomarker. It's easy and feasible to do. The, the major limitation of this biomarker is that 99% of the viral genomes in an infected person are defective. So to date, we don't think these defective genomes, and we cannot exclude that recombination events can occur and lead to a replication component genomes, but to date, the, most of these uh, DNA particles that we're measuring are not uh, replication intact, and therefore not capable at this point to rekindle uh, infection as, as we know it. And what you see on this slide in HIV-infected adults, and these are studies published in 2014 by John Meller's group, showing that up to 10 years of completely suppressive antiretroviral treatment leads to no uh, decay of these, uh, the concentrations of these cells circulating in, in the peripheral blood. Now what you see on this slide is that the, the concentration is about 200 per million, and so this exceeds the concentration you see of replication intact or replication competent genome of one per million. Again, highlighting the extent to which the overwhelming burden of infected cells don't carry replication uh, competent genomes. Now, when, we, when I started in Bob Silcano's lab about 15 years ago, we began to characterize this reservoir in perinatally infected children. And obviously, at the start of the um, combination of treatment error, the kids who were receiving therapy were not newborns. These were kids with established infection. And so this was the first study to demonstrate in kids who were just starting CART at about eight years of age, the demonstration that using these standard virus outgrowth assay, we could readily detect a replication competent reservoir and characterize the composition of this reservoir in children. And what you see here, treating late as eight years of age, which is late for these days, but in, in 1997 it was not, because that was really based on when the, our art was, uh, became standard of care, that the, the concentration of this um, reservoir was similar in HIV-infected children compared to adults. And so to, to summarize the field to this date, to 2009, which is when the, the case of the Berlin patient was reported in the New England Journal, these were, this was really the state of the field, that this is not a, a curable disease. The reservoir in resting memory CD4 T cell was a major barrier. The size was about one per million. Um, one per million resting CD4 cells, although recent data from Yachi Ho and, and Bob Silcana's group using molecular-based approaches instead of um, this culture-based assay have shown that there are a proportion of these uh, integrated genomes, are replication, are geno their genomes are intact for replication, but they're actually not induced in, in the culture assay. And so this has led to the um, calculations using mathematical model that the reservoir size may actually be much larger, 60-fold larger than previously estimated. There's no appreciable decrease in these concentrations over time, and we still don't understand why there's no decrease over a decade or so in, in HIV-infected patients. And that discontinuing therapy, as I showed you in the slide by Tim Shacker's group, showed that even up to 10 years of treatment, viremic relapse occurs within two to four weeks. Again, concluding that treatment needs to be lifelong. Now, the whole field of HIV cure research, it's not new. I mean, cure was used in, in, the, in the late 90s when CART became standard of care, but was quickly, the, the optimism around that was quickly dampened by the identification of HIV reservoirs. But Timothy Brown, and this remains a single case, and, and this is his actually quote from, he, he wrote a, a 
perspective uh, that was recently published in AIDS Research and Human Retroviruses, and he's become a real advocate for uh, cure research from the HIV infected person uh, perspective, but he actually used this, the word cured of HIV. Personally, since my, my um, experience with the Mississippi child, I, I often use it in, in parentheses because I, I think we still don't know to what extent a residual infected pool of cells persists and could reestablish viremia. And this requires, uh, Timothy Brown still requires long-term follow-up to fully declare the state of, of cure. And so what signal cure in the Berlin patient is shown on this slide. So what you see in red is what you standardly see in HIV infected patients. Red is the viral load and so off antiretroviral treatment. As I've said over and over again, there's viremic relapse. So you could see the break in, in combination antiretroviral treatment. There's re, um, return of viremia and then resuppression with heart. But following and actually coinciding with his first allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplantation for acute myelogenous leukemia with specialized cells, CCR5 delta 32 cells, he actually was able to maintain virologic control to clinically undetectable levels now for seven, I think seven and a half, seven and a half years now. So he's actually been considered a sterilizing cure because in-depth search for replication competent virus in, in Mr. Brown has failed to detect a replication competent reservoir. So he would fit our definition of sterilizing cure. And so what you see on this slide is really the timeline with respect to the optimism around HIV cure with a big pause between 1997 and 2009. And now what we're in the stage is really case report gathering uh, phase of, of, of this uh, research effort. And on the far right, you see the Berlin patient in 2009, and it was really in the mindset of this cure research and the uh, development of collaboratories to really synergize uh, research efforts towards identifying strategies to cure HIV that we stumbled upon the case of the Mississippi child. And you know, in late uh, 2012, I was I was called to provide advice with respect to reinitiating antiretroviral treatment in a child with known HIV infection who went off therapy and didn't have rebound viremia. Now, our HIV Cure Committee for Pediatrics was formed in late uh, 2011, and our first charge as a committee was really to define what will be the, the hallmarks or biomarkers of cure in an HIV-infected infant. So it was in that spirit of already being on a pathway to defining a remission cure strategy for pediatrics that we encountered the Mississippi child and was able to quickly um, identify, characterize, and report on the case with some scientific confidence that this case was distinct from any other case we had dealt with in, in our 20 years of treating HIV-infected children. Now with that, there, there were also coincide, um, co uh, simultaneous reports of the Visconti cohort of HIV-infected adults um, treated during primary HIV infection who have maintained virologic control of antiretroviral treatment, the Visconti cohort. And this attests to the to point that Dr. Cameron made yesterday in terms of the importance of having cohorts and biorepositories so we can actually go back and understand um, unique outcomes of our treatment strategies and try to identify biomarkers and, and the factors that are contributing to these outcomes in patients. So to date, the Berlin patient has not been replicated. The Visconti cohort of patients, adult patients treated during acute HIV infection with long-term virologic control for eight or more years in whom HIV infected cells are readily detected, but they're able to maintain virologic control. Recent data suggests that NK cell function may play a role in this long-term suppression in the Visconti cohort. But cohort studies uh, around the world have tried to find a, a, a similar cohort of Visconti-like patients, and, and that has not yet been identified. The Mississippi patient has not been replicated yet. We've not identified another case. If anyone knows of a case, please let us know. And then the Boston patients are uh, Tim Hendricks patients, so two transplant patients who seem to have had cleared reservoirs using our standard biomarker assays, but but then off antiretroviral treatment had rebound viremia. Now it's important to note that in the, in the Boston patients, the two Boston patients, what was different about those patients that they actually did experience delayed vir viremic rebound. So instead of the two to four week rebound, I think one patient took 12 weeks to rebound and the other 32 weeks. So we have some clues that reservoir reduction actually is the first step towards virologic remission and cure with respect to delaying viremic rebound. 
And so what are the strategies that are now in place towards HIV remission and cure? And this is actually, it's a long list, but it's a good, it's a good thing to have a long list. And what's been, and these are all proof of concept studies. The main studies are latency reversing agents. So histac inhibitors, furinostat, panobinostat have been studied. Um, disulfiram has been studied. And all of these latency reversing agents show signal in terms of reversing HIV latency to the point of RNA transcription and in the Panabinistat study, there was actually virus production uh, with that uh, treatment. So providing hope that you can actually reverse latency, get virus production, and hopefully target, be able to target these cells using uh, immunotherapeutic strategies such as broadly neutralizing antibodies. So it's become apparent that, that reversing latency is probably insufficient to clear these infected cells. They may not be, uh, the levels of expression may not be sufficient to actually kill the cells. And here is where the, the, the field is now moving towards combination therapies and proof of concept studies of latency reversing agents in combination with immunotherapeutic strategies. There are immune checkpoint blockade agents like PD-1 inhibitors, analogous to what's being used in the cancer fields to mobilize uh, tumor clearance. So this is to mobilize uh, clearance of infected cells. And then other immune modulating drugs that are shown on this side, serolimus and uh, interferon alpha inhibitors and um, agonists. And the lowest hanging fruit for pediatrics and, and is really very early treatment and very early treatment with immunomodulators. And the, the basic model here, and this is the model we've been working on for the past 15 years, is really the extent to which early treatment affects reservoir establishment in children, but this is applicable to adults and, and adolescents. And that is given that we know that this reservoir is formed in the context of immunologic memory formation. Um, it, it, neonates actually have the immune quiescent state that Dr. Plummer referred to in his talk in terms of uh, slow immune activation, uh, cellular proliferation, kind, a kind of tolerogenic state. And so if we can treat early and this has been our, our hypothesis, if we can treat early and very early, we can perhaps prevent seeding of viral reservoirs, achieve virus reduction, and then promote or enable a state of remission. And what you see on this slide is really the unique um, properties of, of perinatal HIV infection, is that infection is established in the context of a developing immune system. And so infants start out life with less than 10% in the peripheral blood expressing memory T cell phenotypes. So again, if we can curtail virus replication before memory T cell development, we can perhaps uh, curtail spread into these uh, reservoirs. So this is our first study. We're trying to figure out, well, how early is early and how late is too late to achieve this uh, end goal of reservoir reduction. And this is our first study looking at the latent reservoir during early therapy. And early therapy here, it generally takes about two to three months to identify an infant as infected and start them on treatment. Because as most of you know, antibody tests cannot be used to identify infection in infants. You're, it requires nucleic acid testing. You have to be really sure that your nucleic acid test is correct. So it requires repeating that nucleic acid test to confirm infection. So generally around the world where there's access to testing and treatment, and, and here in, in Canada and in the United States, it's infants, HIV infected infants start treatment around two to three months of age. And it turns out, and I'll show you later, that starting around two to three months of age, if kids are suppressed and suppressed for a long time, at least a very favorable profile of persistence, meaning low reservoir size, absent HIV specific immune responses, a really um, favorable platform for immunotherapeutic uh, strategies. But what you see on this slide, so this is six months, 12 months, and, and two years of age on antiviral treatment, shown in blue are kids who started therapy after six weeks of age and in red those less than six weeks of age. The study is completely small, it's proof of concept, not powered for anything. But essentially all it tells you on three mLs of blood, you can identify a reservoir, replication competent reservoir in these kids that persists at a level that we can detect 
assaying three to five mils of blood through two years of life in 60% of these infants. The absence of detectable replication competent reservoir in the 40% at two years of age doesn't mean they're cured. It just means we didn't have enough cells to be able to say, okay, at what level the, the reservoir persists. But 60% still had a replication competent reservoir. So what this means is that two months of age is really too late to think about reservoir reduction in the immediate period of two uh, years of age. Um, these are data showing um, using the proviral DNA load measurements that it's substantially higher in these infants than the replication competent reservoir, again, um, confirming that most are uh, replication deficient. So we have uh, 10 minutes left and I'm going to go really quickly through. So I, I hope I convinced you that it was in the, it was really the platform of information that we had and the backdrop of all of our studies of early therapy in children that led us to recognize that the case of the Mississippi child was really distinct from other cases. And this is our report on absence of rebound viremia in a kid who we, we believed was um, infected and went off therapy and didn't experience rebound viremia. So here's the timeline for the case and I, I most of you are familiar with it, but essentially the child received a three-drug antiretroviral uh, regimen really to prevent infection. And as pediatricians, that still is our major goal, prevent infection. Um, and that was the goal here, but it turns out infection was confirmed because this child was hospitalized, was confirmed in the first week of life. So the three-drug regimen was transitioned to a PI-based regimen by seven days of age. And during this time, the child had complete suppression of virus replication through 18 months of age, went off antiretroviral drugs at 23 and, and showed up five months later off treatment with no rebound in viremia. Intensive laboratory studies were done uh, throughout the period of virologic remission, meaning no uh, return of viremia and then um, post uh, viremic rebound. And so this, uh, of course, we had to convince ourselves that this child was infected. Fortunately, this child was hospitalized, so we had the luxury of having vir frequent viral load testing done in the first 19 days of life, showing persistent virus-producing cells through 19 days of life, convincing me that this child had had an infected pool of cells that was established um, in the first few weeks of life. And here's what remission looks like. It's uh, standard using standard clinical assays. A patient goes from being on antiretroviral, viremic on antiretroviral treatment, suppressed, and then off antiretroviral treatment, the brown no card, you see there's clinically undetectable viral load measurements. And this is what we're looking for in HIV cure research or remission research, where patients can go off treatment and not experience prompt viremic rebound. During the, the phase of remission, we did uh, ultra, ultra sensitive droplet digital PCR methods, looking at different fractions for HIV DNA, because that is the hallmark of infection. And what we could find is intermittently detection of low levels of HIV DNA in this child. But importantly, despite culturing up the 64 million, 1 million replicates of resting cells, we were unable to detect a replication competent reservoir. So, in addition, we looked for uh, markers of exposure, ongoing exposure to, to virus. There was no HIV-specific immune responses based on antibody testing, cellular immune responses, and also this child harbored no HLA protective alleles that would confer spontaneous control of replication and was wild type for CCR5. So in 2013, we concluded from this single case, and I, I agree we went out on a limb on this case, but we did conclude that it was this very early treatment that led to abrogation of reservoir formation that permitted um, very, uh, viral remission. And so, but what we learned from this case, and we continue to follow this case, and we meeting Dr. Hannah Gay, who's the pediatrician who managed this case, identified that this case was different to contact us to assist with the care and continue to follow this case. And really, we did not believe, given all the ultra-sensitive testing that we, would, that we did off antiretroviral treatment, that this kid would actually reestablish viremia but re viremic uh, rebound occurred 27 months. So that's really extremely prolonged um, period of uh, antiretroviral free uh, remission in this child. And rebound viremia was to levels, as I described earlier, seen with um, pre at pretreatment levels. Importantly, at the time of um, rebound viremia, there was a dip in CD4 counts, but during the, the phase of virologic remission, her CD4 T cell percentages uh, stayed very, very stable and returned to normal levels with, with institution of combination antiretroviral treatment. 
And again, importantly for the field, um, with rebound viremia, uh, it took about uh, three, three months for the child to become undetectable, so there was a response to antiretroviral treatment. What we saw with rebound viremia, and again, this is kind of what we, I think this case is very informative in terms of what to expect. You could see that this kid has, is quite capable of developing HIV-specific immune responses. There is a prompt uh, immune response within weeks of rebound viremia with fully developed responses to multiple HIV antigens. Now, what led to viremic relapse in this child? It's unclear. There were no intercurrent illnesses, no recent immunizations. Um, and, but phylogenetic studies, in our mind, this is the best um, support for HIV establishing a small latent pool that can remain quiescent for years, really, 27 months before resurfacing, is the close phylogenetic relatedness shown in, in red and orange and blue between the infant sequences, viral sequences at rebound, this is HIV on full length, full length on, and maternal sequences obtained uh, two, months pri two years prior. Um, and this is quite distinct from sequences of other infant pairs we have in the laboratory. So I know we're running out of time. Um, I think what we'll do is, um, these are the lessons we've learned um, from this case, is that the timing of relapse is unpredictable. It was completely asymptomatic in this child. HIV can remain quiescent for years. This, this um, stochastic uh, reoccurrence of um, viremia fits with the model of stochastic immune activation, reactivation of lately infected cells and highlights really our lack of predictors of virologic rebound and the challenges in defining cure in HIV cure research. Um, I'll end quickly by saying because uh, the, on the heels of the Mississippi child, I know that the Canadian group here, uh, Jason, uh, Jason and, and Ari Bittnam and Hugo Sudines went into the Canadian cohort and identified four infants who were treated similarly to the Mississippi child. And additional countries have, have looked into their cohort. So there's a Milan child and a Dublin child. These are all kids treated within the first few days of life with combination antiretroviral treatment and had biomarker profiling that showed uh, no detectable HIV, and yet there was rebound viremia in these cases within two to four weeks, as I said earlier. So the, the Mississippi child may be like the Berlin patient, like the Visconti cohort, where they're outliers and we still need to, to look harder and do more to end up with these results. But these cases and, and case series actually serve as the catalyst for moving this field forward towards virologic remission and cure. So I think what I'll do is, um, I just wanted to show two, since I, I have three minutes, two, two parts to this, and this is to show what happens with early treatment in children. And so the Canadian case cohort of um, antibody negative, DNA negative, replication competent reservoir negative is very common of early treatment, early effective treatment in children. So meaning treatment at uh, two to three months of age for three to four years of age. A subset of these kids will actually look and test as if they're not infected. But it's important to point out that even though they've had these negative markers, they still harbor replication competent reservoirs that can rekindle um, viremia. Um, a, a second important feature we found with early therapy in children, so that we've now begun uh, long-term follow-up studies on, on children in the U.S. who've been treated for now 18 years, starting at two months of life. And this is a, a, a phenomenon that we're identifying, is that in, in contrast to adults, where you see on the far right, where the proviral DNA load stays constant in the peripheral circulation, we're actually seeing decreasing concentrations of HIV infected cells in these children over a decade or more of therapy. And trying to understand the mechanisms for this decrease in concentration is going to be pivotal for moving our research agenda forward. So I'd like to say that very early treatment and particularly with immunotherapeutic strategies, really has a role for beginning the cure agenda in pediatric HIV infection. But this is not to neglect the majority of chronically infected children who would have not benefited from early treatment. And for these children, we hope to be able to apply the strategies in the top part of the list that are being done in infected adults. And this brings me to the new hope for um, immunotherapeutic strategies, and that's broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been mentioned uh, yesterday and in this morning's talk. And this is really a, a, a new immunotherapeutic approach uh, to HIV that's very exciting in that these are uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that have high neutralization activity, 
against HIV and multiple tiers of HIV. And the first in human trials have just been conducted by Michelle Newsom Sykes group showing that these broadly neutralizing antibodies actually have antiviral effects in humans and can draw plasma viral loads from 0.8 to 2.5 logs with a single infusion. And so we believe that the future for this field um, and many others believe is there is a role now for combining these strategies with broadly neutralizing. Um, antibodies. And so I think to, to focus on the pediatric agenda to end these remarks, but this is common to early treated adults too, or, or applicable to early treated ad adults, is that we believe early treatment reduces reservoirs, provides a favorable profile with respect to H absent HIV specific immune responses that's critical uh, for moving the field forward. So I'll stop it acknowledging that the two, my two collaborators, Dr. Hannigan and Lazuriaga, who were actually the, the force behind the Mississippi child and the analyses and the people in my laboratory and the funding agencies. Uh, thank you and I'll take questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, thank you for, I'll be brief. Uh, did you observe any uh, rebound in the integrated DNA in the Mississippi kid prior or after yeah. rebound? So that's a that's an interesting question. So it was um, so one month prior to rebound, we did receive um, a sample for resting cell culture, and it was noted during that sample processing that we got lower uh, resting CD4 T cells than we usually get from this child, substantially lower. And um, you know, so I asked the pediatrician, you know, was there any intercurrent illnesses or anything, and there was no report of any event. So obviously I blamed it on the, the lab processing. Um, but it turns out we went back and actually looked at, so usually in this child we pull samples and then do single copy RNA assays. And we went back and that one month visit actually prior to viremic rebound, which was really detected on routine serial monitoring, there was actually detection of two LTR circles in the activated cell fraction and also the single copy assay of our load was nine copies per ml one month prior. So we could actually time at least uh, resurgence of new infected cell uh, cells in the circulation one month prior to prompt uh, viremic rebound. Post rebound there is, uh, you know, CD4 T cell burden is about uh, 100 per million uh, P PBMCs, and we're waiting to study whether a reservoir, to what to what extent the reservoir is reestablished um, once uh, we have achieved control of virus replication for six months. Thank you for the question. On behalf of CAR, oh. I'd like to thank you very much for thank an excellent you very presentation. Much. Thank you, Jason. And, uh, thank you. Thank you.